In triple negative breast cancer, we've made a lot of progress as well. Not quite as much progress as HER2 positive disease, but uh, there are a number of different areas of interest. I think now with the most recent trials, the Brightness trial and a trial from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital in India, we've really solidified the role of carboplatin in combination with paclitaxel followed by an anthracycline cyclophosphamide combination chemotherapy uh, for the optimal chemotherapy backbone for patients with at least stage two triple negative breast cancer. We haven't really made progress in the optimal therapy for smaller triple negative breast cancer, should you use platinum or not, uh, with a T1C versus T1A and B. What's the smallest size tumor that needs treatment? We don't really have the answers to that question um, overall, although in general, very small tumors are the tumors where we might not need chemotherapy at all. Uh, but with that backbone of chemotherapy, uh, there's a number of other questions. So uh, one is, is there an alternate if you have, for example, a germline BRCA mutation. There is some very intriguing data with uh, a, the PARP inhibitor talazoprib as neoadjuvant therapy. That hasn't been pursued further, but hopefully in the future it will be with the no new uh, generation PARP inhibitors. And then, of course, we have the Olympia trial, which showed that olaparib in patients who have at least stage 2 triple negative breast cancer or residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy uh, improves survival compared to not giving olaparib. And then, of course, we have Keno 522 that showed a significant improvement, not just in PCR, but event-free and distant recurrence-free survival with pembrolizumab. Again, with that chemotherapy backbone with the platinum taxane followed by anthracycline cyclophosphamide um, in patients who had at least stage 2 uh, triple negative breast cancer, I think solidifying a number of things, the importance of immunotherapy, it's an approved treatment. Uh, the second is also, it, I think, emphasizing how important it is to treat in the neoadjuvant setting. Uh, because now we can answer the next question, which is in patients who didn't have a pathologic complete response, how can we escalate therapies? And in patients who did have PCR, do they really need to have a whole nother six months of pembrolizumab? We've also been aware of a number of different factors that pdl one is not required for the benefit of pembrolizumab in the neoadjuvant setting, but it does predict better response overall. Those patients have a higher PCR rate. Um, that stage, the more burden of disease that you have, uh, the lower your PCR rate, the worse EFS, and the greater benefit from the checkpoint inhibitor, which is also interesting, suggests a synergy with the uh, sort of relative tumor suppression of the host immune response. Um, and then also we've learned about immune toxicity. So there's more immune toxicity when you combine the checkpoint inhibitor with chemo versus giving the checkpoint inhibitor alone in the adjuvant setting. And we really need to be educated and aware and make our patients and uh, providers aware of the toxicity so we can recognize them earlier and treat them early, which is so important to avoid significant morbidity. But there are toxicities that are lifelong, the endocrine toxicity, some skin toxicities and others. Um, then the next step is really where do we go from here from those treatments? And uh, one is to look at non-anthracycline based chemotherapy regimens. There's been good PCR rates with uh, docetaxel carboplatin uh, and then docetaxel carboplatin with Pembro. So there is a, a randomized trial in the cooperative group, very large, over 2,000 patients looking at that regimen with Pembro versus the standard Keynote 522 with Pembro. Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are of great interest. Maybe we can identify a group of patients who need less therapy or even no therapy based on the data we have who have very high TILs. And there is a study, NeoTract, as well as others, that is looking at uh, stratifying treatment based on uh, TILs in the tumor sample. So that will be fascinating. And then another direction is to look at uh, therapy alter altering therapy based on response in the neoadjuvant setting rather than waiting for the surgical uh, response. And so iSPY 2.2, an adaptively randomized multi-arm phase two study that is in many centers in the United States um, and it run out of our institution uh, is a trial that now is looking at uh, these gene signatures for response to immunotherapy and DNA damaging agents and randomizing patients based on a number of different biologic factors and gene signatures uh, to receive different experimental therapies initially for 12 weeks. And then based on that response, which is carefully evaluated by imaging and biopsies, you could either 
either escalate or de-escalate and go directly to surgery. So in that way, you're really individualizing the intensity of treatment uh, based on response and trying to optimize the response in the patients who have uh, not as good a response up front. So that's a very exciting area. And then lastly, uh, these cell-free DNA or circulating tumor DNA is another uh, sort of future uh, approach where you might be able to change therapy based on clearance of CTDNA or not. There's some very early data that suggests that this may be a useful tool.